if not ask again, but. That's, uh, that's important. Uh, <coughs> in a lot of your Gen Chem book, they talk about the subatomic particles. When we're doing mass spec, we're doing whole molecules, really, that are just been ionized, that have masses uh, much greater than just a single electron. Okay, let's see if we can apply uh, or assign these three here. Uh, hopefully you've already done that. Uh, can someone tell me which compound below belongs to the top spectrum? One, two, or three. Which one belongs to the top? Third one? Okay, I hear the third one. Anybody else? Anybody have something different? First thing I would do is look at structures and let's predict how this will cleave. Alpha cleavage, cleave next to a long pair. We have long pairs here. Ah, uh, do I want to cleave here? No. No, we want to put cation next to a long pair. We want to put maybe cation here or here. Put cation here, I want to cleave here. And that's going to just give, we'll see if this marker is good. <coughs> boom, boom, or plus. <laughs> and we lost uh, a CH3 radical. Why is this a good cation? Well, it's next to a long pair, we can show resonance, the resonance structure. So this would be L minus 15. Uh, first off, do all these have the same mass? Because if it was three different masses, we could just look at the molecular ion and, and... But I think they're all the same mass. They're all constitutional isomers. What is the mass? I think it's probably all 88. Everyone's 88. So this is 88 minus 15. So what is this? 73? Okay. Um, we cleave here, but the same thing. Here's the same thing. <coughs> Can we cleave something here and get a cation here? What do we have to cleave here? That's a CH3. You can cleave an H. Okay. Uh, we'll see if we need to do that. Cleave an H. That would be give a peak at 87. Uh, but that's a major alpha cleavage. Here, where do you want to cleave? Where do you want to put a cation at? How about right there? Yes. If we cleave there, what do we get? M minus what? 15. 15. If we cleave here, what do we get? M minus Yes, M minus 29. Okay, you got to see that. Cleave here, put cation here, we lose the ethyl radical, that's 29. Do we predict 20, uh, M minus 29 here? No, but we do up there. Both of these, M minus 15. But that one also M minus 29. How about the top one? I'm going to pull this down. And uh, your paper you have. What do you want to cleave here? Can I in there? So we cleave here. That would be M minus what? Yes, M minus 43. Not 45. Do we expect M minus 43 below? I don't think so. Uh, we can also cleave an H and give an M minus uh, 1. We got some numbers on the board, though. Uh, by the way, what is M minus 43? Since it's 88, that would be 45. So there we expect a 45. The second one we expect... M minus 29 would be what? 59? Is that right? Yes. MI 15 is uh, 73. <clears throat> but, the, but the third one, we also expect 73. Okay. Let's see. This one, I expect a 45. Which mass spectrum has a peak at 45? Hopefully, one of them does. <laughs> oh, look at there. Nice big peak at 45. 
I only expect 45 for the first compound. I think it's the third spectrum. Let's tentatively say, okay, that's compounds one, two, and three. So this is compound what? One. 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 We'll see if we have to revise this. But question. Um, yeah, but so like when you do the cleaves, again, like initial, like, can't you use the fact that like some radicals are more stable than others to know like how prominent it'll be? You can. In comparing what the um, so like in the second compound where there's like you need to cleave a methyl or an ethyl. Probably the ethyl is going to be more preferred because an ethyl radical is more stable than a methyl radical. Cleaving the ethyl gives us minus 29. You can potentially use that. Um, okay. Well, I'm going to look over at spectrum just because it's nicely shown there. That's the middle spectrum up there. I see a big peak at 59. Did we predict 59 for any of them? Yeah. Middle one. We predicted 59 from alpha cleavage. What else did we predict for the middle one? It's also got a 73. And which one's bigger? Uh, more intense. And which one did, uh, 59 is tall, that means more of the ions were turned into current. You got a bigger signal. You got more current produced from, because there are more ions, because it produced more of those. Um, it looks like the middle one is number two. I'm not gonna write that up there. That means the first spectrum is what? Number three, and that's what someone suggested earlier. Let's see if that's confirmed. What do we predict for three? 73. 73. Out of 73, we also predicted, what else did we predict for the third one? See, we don't really predict the cleave. Hold on. We could. If we cleave there and lose that, that's loss of 31, right? Yes. What do we get? Is this reasonable to get? Yes. Nice tertiary cation. Uh, so that's another reason to say that that one. Is that the second or first or second? First. first spectrum belongs to the third compound because there's another peak that we can assign. Not only is alpha cleavage good, putting cation next to long pair, but just getting like tertiary cations which are not resonance stabilized, that's also good. Basically that's just a little, uh, little practice of doing that. There's others to work in the workbook. Any questions about mass spec? Come up. There's lots of other peaks, ions that hit the detector, etc., but we don't need to sign them all. 
Okay, let's get back to uh, elimination. THF is just a solvent, tetrahydrofuran. Uh, we've got this sodium plus O minus. O minus, that's a, that could be a nucleophile. It could also be a base. So we can envision some chemistry with this leaving group, leaving group chemistry. Um, is this going to be substitution or elimination? By elimination. Very bulky base slash nucleophile. Bulky bases slash nucleophile prefer elimination over substitution. Because elimination, attacking an H is much easier than doing a backside attack very precisely on a, you know, on a carbon that has groups also bonded to it. Now you can do SN2 here. Because uh, it's only secondary. But this, with the bulky base, looks like it's probably going to be, we probably want to go with E2. Definitely 2, meaning bimolecular, because we got a strong bully base. This is a nice, this could be E2. Okay, knowing it's E2, uh, what type of product are we make? What functional group are we making? We get an alkene, okay. Uh, beta hydrogens, there's two here, there's one here. Which one, that one here is bolded, we'll call that A, and then you got two here. Of course, one is bolded and one is dashed. We'll call that B and C. Which H do you think will be abstracted? Give me, give me your rationale for, somebody said A, why A? Because E1 would be A, because you want the more substituted alkene. More substituted alkene is the one you typically want. When would you not be able to get that, and when would uh, you start getting the other alkene? When the base becomes too bulky. And see, this H is sort of hidden between these groups. These are more accessible because that, that says tertiary CH is a secondary CH, more accessible. The problem here is we don't know if this is bulky enough to keep it from taking that one, et cetera, et cetera. Do what? Which one? The H. HA? Not currently, but that bond can rotate. It has free rotation. You have to check to see which one's scope later. Which one of which? Okay, here we go. I'm pretty confident this is going to be an elimination because of the bulky base. What's hard to say is are we going to get Hoffman or Sate cell? I know that the bulkier the base, the more prone I am to getting the Hoffman product. <laughs> but what makes a, bite, a base bulky, so bulky that that's going to be the major product? That's where it's difficult. So I have to give you some, okay, this is what we're going to do. Well, let's do this. Show both products. Show the Sate set product and show the Hoffman product. Show them both. Does someone already have a product um, that I can look at? Or we can show on the overhead? The Hoffman product is going to be the easier one. I'll 
draw it over here. Hoffman product is going to be I think it's 1F, but it may be 2. I think it's OF, HF, MAN. Here's your Hoffman product. Understand the Hoffman product is the least substituted, dye substituted. It comes from taking the more accessible H, dye substituted. When we put the double bond over here, it's going to be tri substituted. This is less substituted. Okay, why did I draw a trans and not cis? It is more stable, but that's not necessarily the reason why. When the E2 elimination concerted mechanism takes place, the H and the chlorine have to be what? <coughs> Anticoplanar. Uh, which one is anticoplanar? Okay, here's the take home. Whenever there's two on the, on the carbon, two beta hydrogens that are identical, they can both be anticoplanar through rotation. And since both can be, how are we going to decide which product we're going to do? The most stable, the most stable one gets, gets, becomes the, the major. Because it has a choice. Once you have a choice, then you, okay, something else has got to decide for you, and, and it's the most stable. The take home is if you have two, you don't have to do any <coughs> Newman projections or anything. And just show the most stable one. Because nature will choose the most stable transition state. The most stable is going to be the group's anti. That's it. Okay. It's awesome. Okay, well, let's do the SAID cell. The SAID cell involves taking which H? HA. There's only one of those. Now, that H has to be anti coplanar to the leaving group. It doesn't have to be, but it's highly preferred. And unless it can't be, that's what we're going to do. Can this be anticoplanar to the chlorine? It certainly can by rotation. This is where we need to do a Newman. Uh, I'm going to do a Newman standing over here, looking down this carbon. There's the front carbon, here's the back carbon. Circle, circle, dot, dot. Front carbon, what's coming straight down as I look, look down the bond? Methyl coming straight down. What's coming out towards you guys as I look down that bun? Hydrogen. Hydrogen coming out to your, you guys, that's my right. So as I'm looking down that bond, I see an H to the right. What's to the left on that front car been going behind the board? It's ethyl. One behind the board. There's the front carbon. Okay, back carbon. What's going straight down on the back carbon? Ethyl. It's actually eclipsed with the methyl. What's on the second carbon going towards you guys? So if I'm looking at the second carbon, the chlorine is on my right going towards you guys. It's actually eclipsed. And what's going, what's on that carbon going behind the board? I'm drawing H. And it's actually eclipsed. See, that's actually shown in an eclipse confirmation. Okay. Which one, where's HA at? Don't, get, don't confuse which is HA. Right. Hold on, I, something's wrong here. Chlorine's coming off the back carbon. And this is H. Okay, these are clips right in front of each other. They're planar, meaning that there's a plane right there, but are they anti or sin? Or, Anticoplanar or simcoplanar? They're sin. They're on the same side planar. We need it to be like this planar. I need to rotate one or front or back. I'm going to rotate the front and put HA over here. And the 
before we do that, see if there were two H's on the on the front carbon, you could put two different ones, Auntie. And if you can put two different ones, how are you going to choose? You're going to choose the more stable conformation. And that leads to the more stable alkene. That's why I drew the more stable alkene. But here we only got one, and it has to be the one. And when we do that, the back carbon is still H, chlorine, and ethyl. Now the HA is over here. What's here? Ethyl? Hold on. That's right. That's right. That's right. Methyl? No. No, hold on. We're rotating the front. Oh, there's two ethyls. There's one on the front carbon and back carbon. Um, and then everything is basically being rotated 180 degrees, so the methyl is going to go straight up. Now we can eliminate, see that's, that's, that's anti-coplanar or anti-periplanar it's known as. So if I hold up a sheet of paper, there's your plane. We can't see the two carbons where we're going to put the double bond in. But when we do, when the base takes the H, the electrons move in between the carbons. I can't really see them. You kick off the chlorine. These groups and these groups are set. The two ethyls are on the same side. The double bond gets put in. The two ethyls are on the same side. What's on the other side of the plane? A hydrogen, which is on which carbon? It really doesn't matter. You got two ethyls, but um, I'll draw it here. What else is here? A methyl. I'll label this ME and I'll label this ME. Here's your product. <laughs> See, this actually has to rotate as we did it here for the elimination to take place. When it does, the two ethyls are stuck on the same side. Now this, is this E or Z? Z. Two party groups are on the same side. Is he the most stable of that <coughs> of that alkene? No. Most stable would have your big groups anti or, or trans. We don't get that because we have to meet this anti-coplanar requirement. It can eliminate syncoplanar, but it ain't going to eliminate syncoplanar if anti-coplanar is available. So this is St. Seth. You can spell it however you want. You can put S there and Z there. It's spelled a variety of ways. How do we do? Those didn't work those. How do you do? The bulkier your base, the more likely you're going to get Hoffman. What will that one give? I don't know. It's hard to say. Here's, here's why I don't want to put a, a precise answer on because I might say, hey guys, let's say a bulky base is going to get coffee. But I've seen some standardized tests that say this is the product because they just want you to do elimination instead of substitution. They say, hey, stair chamber base, I want my answer to be an elimination product. But for some reason, they didn't show you the Hoffman product. So you got to be open to, okay, what are the possible answers? Different people have different take on them. Uh, if you need more feedback, let me know. Let's do the next one. Okay, triethylamine is, that's what that is. It's just a nitrogen with three ethyls. It's an sp3 nitrogen. Even though it's neutral, it is strong enough to do an E2 elimination. Consider a strong base strong enough to do E2. It is sterically hindered because of the three ethyls. So this is sort of classical E2 elimination. So I have a product here. Now we're getting into some rings.
somebody have a product? <clears throat> what you got? On here, what's here? The ethyl that still has the steric chemistry? Yeah. We eliminate uh, HI from, from so that's beta hydrogen, a circle, then the H and the I. Vision putting a double bond in there. Uh, there's also an H here. Why that and not? on here. By the way, if you do this, this carbon is now trigonal planar. Don't draw your ethyl like that. Okay? It's now trigonal planar. Everything's in the plane. Ethyl would just be drawn straight. And that's where we eliminate this H and I, which I'm on in here. Uh, is this Hoffman or Saitsev? This is, this is more substituted. That's called Saitsev. That's called Hoffman. Okay. Which one do you like? The H and the I are cis. Okay. Well, if you think about it, things that are in a cis relationship cannot be anti coplanar. Anti is synonymous with trans. <coughs> It cannot be. <clears throat> Let's draw a chair confirmation of that. <coughs> Let's put the iodine right here. Do you remember how does the how does the leaving group have to be in the chair confirmation for the anti to be possible. Axial. Axial. So I'm going to draw it axial. Now let's put the ethyl here. Since the iodine is axial, how do we want to draw the ethyl? Axial. Now the iodine and the ethyl are trans, so you want it to be. Now it's also axial. They're trans. <laughs> Iodine is up compared to the H. The ethyl is down compared to the H. Here's the H. The H is equatorial. The H is equatorial. It's on there. Let's label these as A, B, and C. This is A, correct? The one that's on the carbon with the ethyl? Okay. Why did we learn chair confirmations and Trans, cis, up, down, that type of stuff. So we can now do this. The iodine is straight up. To be anti coplanar, the H has to be what? Straight down. But it ain't straight down. The ethyl's straight down. I mean, iodine's up and the H is like that. Are those coplanar? No, you got two different planes here. We need to be straight down to be in the same plane. Not anti coplanar. What if we do a ring flip? Will they be? No, they never will be. Look back at the opening uh, in intro to anti coplanar. <coughs> I mean, if you do a ring flip, the iodine won't be axial. We already said it has to be axial. Let's look at the H's next door, though. These two H's. One of them is straight down, and one of them is equatorial parallel with that. Which one's straight down? Well, first off, we need some stereo chemistry. Let's make this bold. Yeah, because that is tetrahedral. Which one is straight down? C. Somebody? C. And that's B. Because C and iodide are trans, right? Dashed and bold, trans. What's trans to straight up? 
Straight down. Okay? Of the two H's, which one is anti periplanar or anti coplanar to the I W? That guy right there. Now you can't see the plane here. If I was holding the molecule, the plane would actually be turned this way. The iodine's over there straight up on that tip. The H is on this carbon over here straight down, but the plane is through there. Okay? It's like if I took, if I agree that's the iodine, here's the H straight down. If I turn this, now they're both on the board and the plane of the board. Straight up, straight down. Um, and the base triethylamine takes this H, these electrons move in, take that off, E2. Well, that's the only H that's anti coplanar. Which product do you get? You get this one. Which H remains? HB remains. And of course, there's what here? HA? No, you may need to distinguish which one. Because I may ask you to do that so I see that you understand the anti coplanar uh, stuff. Um, questions about that one? That one, don't, that one you're going to get Hoff, Hoffman only because the H just cannot be eliminated. <coughs> And it's going to prefer to do an anti coplanar and it's going to get the hop. Not, not the more thermodynamic and stable states in. Uh, two below. Here's a question. Which would be faster? I'm erasing. The difference is right here. Here the two groups are trans, they're cis. Which would be faster? How in the world do you assess this? Faster. How does the iodine have to be to eliminate? Mm. Axial? Okay. Does it make sense that the compound with the iodine is more often in the axial position? It's going to eliminate faster? Which compound would the iodine be more likely is more likely to be in the axial position? <coughs> the other group is a big T butyl. Turk butyl group. Which position is the turbutyl going to prefer? Equatorial. Let's draw this here. T butyl is one of your bigger groups. It's, it's going to be like, hey, I want to be equatorial. That's it, forget about it. Let's put it equatorial. I get the enantiomer here. I have to take time to do the enantiomer. It's not relevant. I get the enantiomer wrong. Don't, don't hold it against me. The iodine is not one carbon away, but other. Since we put that there, is the iodine axial equatorial? Um, well, let's do A first. This is A. There's cis. So how do we want to draw the iodine? H is up. So this is down compared to the H. We want this down compared to the H. Down compared to the H is up is axial. I 
need to I need to kind of make this a little more sharper. <laughs> supposed to be equatorial there. So that's an up carbon, it gets an up bond, the other one is equatorial. Okay, let's do B. The T bill is where it wants to be. This is B. How's the I done for B? They're trans, so this is going to be This one is equatorial. Okay, is this one going to want to do a ring flip? Or does the T doodle like being here? This needs to do a ring flip to put the iodine axial so it can eliminate. Is it going to want to do a ring flip? No, it's not going to want to go to the to the position that it can eliminate. Well, guess what? That one's already in the position. The favorite position is the position that we need to eliminate. Which one's more likely to exist in the uh, needed confirmation? B. B will thus eliminate faster because it's more it's more often in the right confirmation. Does that make sense? You've got to get this to undergo a ring flip before it can eliminate. It's going to be hesitant to do that. Uh, I showed to one here what other product can be formed in reaction A or B. It's the same thing. What other product can be formed in A? Yeah, instead of eliminating down here with this H, we could eliminate it up there. In both cases, it would be disubstituted, and so there's not going to be much preference. So I really couldn't ask you to determine between Hoffman and Sage stuff there, so I just showed you the product, or a product. It's more of a rate question. Everybody understand the rate? Questions about this? Okay. That sort of finishes up E1, E2. We'll do some miscellaneous things here. In summary, when you have a choice of which products to choose from E1, what do you get with E1? Most stable alkene you can show for beta elimination. Because really E1 is an equilibrium reaction. We didn't talk about the equilibrium back and forth, but it is. I pretty much told you when you do E1, most stable. You don't have the anti coplanar requirement. When you do E2, you'd also like to get the more substituted alkene, but sometimes you just can't. Either because of sterics from, from the base. The most important reason, though, is you've got to do the anticoplanar, which is highly preferred. Sometimes that leads you to the, uh, the Z product instead of the E product. Okay, so miscellaneous things. <coughs> we need a substitution. Okay, we're going to start going back and look at the substitution and elimination. When either are possible, which will occur? The first thing we can say is that heat favors elimination. Why? Because in your Gibbs free energy equation, heat magnifies which term? Entropy. Which do you get more entropy consideration? Substitution or elimination? Elimination. Typically, you convert one molecule into two when you eliminate like HBr or water. So eliminations are more entropically favored. And if you heat, you'll magnify that favorable entropy term, and it'll want to eliminate more based on your thermodynamics. Heat favors elimination. So if you take this, heat it in water, now heat, how much? It is kind of relative. We're going to say 
Higher is better for getting the, you get the E1 product. Mechanistically, what's the first step of this mechanism? What's the first step of, uh, of an E1? Uh, same as an S in one, beta group ionizes. Okay? Beta group ionizes. What happens next to get that product? Some base takes the H. It can either be Br minus. I actually showed Br, HBr being formed. Takes the H, electrons move in. That's a fast step to get the two products. Water didn't do anything. Water is just kind of like a solvent. Or you can show water taking the H and you can form H3O plus Br minus. That's actually more direct because how does HBr exist in water? plus be your mind. Again, I like to show actual neutral molecules. Okay? Well, how would you get an SN1 product? Instead of this taking place at the cation, what would happen? Maybe some nucleophile attacks cation, that would be an SN1 product. I mean, water could attack cation if you include it. But what I'm showing here is, if you want the elimination to take place, how can you make that favored? Higher heat's going to favor your, your elimination. See, very often your E1 and SN1, they both can occur. Well, I showed the SN1 product down here already. Hold on, how did the OH get on that card? Yeah, instead of, instead of the elimination, you just do not taking the H. But what you could do is you could show the H moving over. Got I here and go from secondary to tertiary and then water attacking, eventually losing the H to the bromine, you get something like that. That's an SN1 problem. If you wanted this to be the product, would you heat the bejeebies out of it, or would you want to do it at fairly low temperature? <coughs> Lower temperature. So all that we've said a couple of times before. Okay, another, another idea here. Involvement of a good nucleophile will favor substitution, while a poor nucleophile will favor elimination. For example, it's known if you take that alcohol and react it with HBr, that's your major product. Assuming temperature is constant in both of these example reactions. But if you react it with HF, the major product is the elimination product. What's going on here? Well, which is a better nucleophile, B or minus or F minus? Yeah. Br minus is a better nucleophile. F minus is actually a better base. <coughs> See, that's that subtle difference between nucleophile and base. In both cases, it's S and one or E one. <coughs> and so, what's the common intermediate? Carbocation. How do you get to this point? I'm not going to do full mechanism. What's the first step to get to that point? Prognate the OH, either with HBr, strong acid, H+, or that H+. They're both stronger acids, really strong. I mean, that's, that's one of your seven wonders of the world, right? Strong acid. HF, HF is also fairly strong. Prognate, ionize, get here. Now, if you've got Br-, it's 
it's a better nucleophile, it'll add to the carbon and give you that product. Good nucleophile will favor substitution. But F minus will instead act as a base, and bases prefer to take H's. It'll take the H, electrons move in, and you get the elimination. <coughs> now, you don't have to say, okay, well, tell me what are good nucleophiles and what are good bases. Now, the bigger point is just understanding the relative. Trend. For example, if we reacted this with HI, would you expect an alkyl iodide or would you expect the alkene? Alkyl iodide. Alkyl iodide. Alkyl iodide. 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 <laughs> it's one of the great nucleophiles. Okay? said, sort of back with alkene chemistry, that F minus will ever, never act as a nucleophile in this class. Neither will sulfate or phosphate. Thus, we can show this common reaction. Alcohols, you can dehydrate them to make alkenes using sulfuric acid. What's the difference in the two formulas? What have we lost here in one computer here? Yes. Formula has lost water in going to that. So you can call that a dehydration reaction. All right. What mechanism is this? Well, we eliminated water, so it's elimination. Is it SN E1 or E2? E2 requires a strong base. E2 requires a strong base. Oh, you're going to get this right. Is sulfuric acid a strong base? No. No, it ain't a strong base. It's a strong acid. Okay? It's as simple as that, guys. E2 requires a strong base. Sulfuric acid ain't a strong base. It's E1. So noted it's E1. What's the first step? Now the OH leaves. Everybody agrees? Oh, they ain't there now. I make OH a better leaving group. Protonating with strong acid. Do we have a strong acid? Yes. So mechanistically, can I show that? I'm going to show full mechanism. What's the next step? Ionization. Uh, and what do we get? Is that there? There's your minus water. How do we get final product? Okay, I'm not showing full Lewis structure. There's a long pair here. By the way, you guys try to do something like this on the test. This does not have an HS bond. <laughs> okay? I know that I never really show full Lewis structure here, but it ain't that. Um, and I usually just sort of do something like this, but there's a long pair there, taking the H, putting in the double bond. That's the second step of an E1. That's the fast step. And what are we reforming right here? Yes. So if you're acid reform, so this is a sulfuric acid catalyzed dehydration of an alcohol. It's a very common reaction of alcohols to make alkenes. And we'll do that in organic too. But when we do it, I'll spend two minutes on it because I expect you already to know this. Any questions about that mechanism? Were the things I just discussed with that mechanism sort of repeats of pulling it all together? Uh, 
Um, and of course, we've already looked at this reaction. But well, it's different though. If we react this with HI, you don't get elimination, but instead you get SN, SN1. Why do you get substitution there and not elimination? We answered this five minutes ago. Iodine is a great nucleophile. It'll act, it'll add to the carbon. It'll act as a nucleophile. Okay. But sulfuric acid, the, the bisulfate won't. It'll just end up taking a proton, or water will take it. Ah. Uh, now we've already answered. We've already stated this. But this is sort of a restatement. Just to focus on it. A more sterically hindered base will favor elimination over substitution. I'm just kind of presenting it in a little bit different context. Some of you actually have talked about this at SI today. For example, if you wanted to do that reaction right there, which reagent is best? The last one? Huh? Why the last one? Oh, it's the most bulky. It's the most sterically hindered. We do want elimination. I mean, if you use hydroxide, it can eliminate. Guess what? You're doing a double E2 elimination in lab this week using hydroxide. But, I mean, this can also do substitution. As soon as you want it to only do elimination, then it'll, it'll do substitution. All right? Uh, because this one can just do this, right? I mean, it's, if you want something that's directly hindered that won't do that, it'll just take the beta hydrogen. So does that make sense? Now, in this example, there's only one alkene product because there's only one beta hydrogen. There's no beta hydrogen over here. So you don't have any uh, regio isomers to consider. Uh, what's next? Clever ways to make ionization of an alkyl halide to a carbocation faster. How do we make OH a better leaving group? Pronade. What did that make turn the oxygen into the, the important part? It made the oxygen positive. Protonation of the oxygen makes it positive. Okay. Now halides are fairly good leaving groups on their own, on their own. But what if we could make a halide positive? Would it make it a better leaving group? Yeah. Typically, you don't protonate halides. This is not a strong bond. So what's another way to make a halide positive? Silver ion. Let me erase some of this. But didn't y'all do silver test uh, last week? Last week you made an alkyl chloride. You reacted it with silver ion. So what if you want to do this, heat it, heat it with water, or really any solvent, it really doesn't matter if you want it to eliminate, because the water is essentially not going to be incorporated into the molecule. <clears throat> but that's secondary. The secondaries aren't going to be quick to ionize. Sometimes they may be a little stubborn. If this was chlorine, it'd be even more stubborn. If you include silver ion in a form like silver nitrate, that will get it to ionize. How? Well, that's Ag plus, similar to H plus. Halogen and silver make, has very strong attraction. And this will start, I'm hesitant to show a covalent bond here, but there's, there's going to be some attraction here. Because <coughs> those just 
there's some elements on the periodic table that are just contracted, like silicon and oxygen, phosphorus and oxygen, silicon and fluorines, all of your halogens and silver. That's why in GenChem you learn that your silver halides are not soluble in water. Because the attraction is so strong that even water can't help break the attraction. Um, but it's sort of like, okay, I'm your carbon and I'm a, I'm a halide. What do we want? I mean, just to break away and ionize off and leave you as a plus? Well, if I'm hesitant to do that for some reason, well, what if a nice little silver ion is walking by? <laughs> My electrons start being attracted to the silver ion because of nature. Somehow my electron good wine here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sorry. I, I like you, but I'm going with the silver. So uh, there's some type of attraction, but basically this is like I'm out of here. Um, and what do you get? You get your cation and you make silver what? Silver bromide, and that will precipitate. Those guys are now happy. All right, happily ever after. Um, and here's your cation. Now you can do your elimination or substitution, but you're doing S N one or E one. So it's sort of analogous to protonating an alcohol, but it's the same. Now, what do we want to call silver ion as a general term? We want to call it a base acid. Lewis base or a Lewis acid. What's the definition of Lewis acid? It sort of accepts the long pair. Okay? It's called a Lewis acid. See, you can almost kind of just show it doing this, but I'm a little bit hesitant to showing a BR plus. But the silver X is a Lewis acid. It accepts the bromine's long pairs. Um, now, this will form, silver will yank a halogen off of any, just about any sp3 carbon. Except maybe a primary. But the product you made last week in lab was a tertiary chloride. And how can you tell if you indeed got that product? Add some silver ion. And if you get silver chloride precipitate, I mean, that's because the silver yanked the chlorine off there and made a carbocation. The silver chloride was your chemical test observation. But if this is an OH or something else, silver is not going to yank it off. So silver ion is a test for presence of ionized halogen. Question? Oh, it's not there. It's the HGBR. Got to see that in Jim Kim? Oh, it's a down arrow. <coughs> Precipitate. Y'all don't do that in gin chem? How do you do it in gin chem? Solid. Solid? S? Okay. Uh, down is, is precipitate. Um, what does that mean? Gas. Yes. Gas, yes. Assuming is what? Less gas than here. Yeah, and that it's not uh, so cold that it doesn't do whatever or whatnot. But typically, those are general terms. Um, okay, so silver ion. Let's see what else it takes. Well, it's similar to using H plus to make an OH a better leaving group. You can actually use this as a chemical test. Which compound would give a precipitate when treated with silver nitrate? Which compounds? Two, three, and four. Two, three, and four are all halogens on. I mean, if this ionizes, it'd be a secondary cation. Can that happen? Yeah. If that ionizes, it'd be a tertiary cation and resonance stabilized. Yeah? Yeah. If that ionizes, it'd be what? It'd be primary, but it would be resonance. <coughs> and it'd really be secondary primary. All three can ionize. Can this ionize? No. No, that bromine's on an sp2 carbon. Don't ionize there. 
<coughs> we're doing tetrahedral chemistry for a reason. Of these three, which we get to precipitate the fastest? Basically, you're looking for which is the best cation, which is going to be formed fastest. Yeah. Not only would it be tertiary, but it would also be resonance stabilized. So those are some types of questions. Any questions about that? Uh, with the time we have left, let's see what we have here. We'll mention solvents. We'll mention uh, deuterium isotope effect. Please look at that. Okay. There's also some questions here on the back. Please do those. <coughs> and on Thursday, we will finish up this handout and we'll likely start the uh, UV Biz handout which I sent by email yesterday. Uh, we'll see if there's any questions about substitution elimination, uh, etc. etc. Before we dismiss any questions, we've got a couple minutes. The lab uh, you're doing this week uh, is a double E2 elimination. We do need to say something about that, and one of the problems on the sheet that you need to be working addresses that. The second elimination of the double E2, some of you have already have noticed this, the leaving group is on a sp2 carbon. I told you that's a no-no. That will be one time it can happen. But don't, don't try to do it any other time. You'll probably get in trouble. So that is sort of an exception. But that's one reason it takes pretty high heat. We had to use that high boiling solvent in 30 minutes of reflux. So it's a little bit tough. Um, but that lab will be due week. Yeah, next week is Thanksgiving, right? Yeah. yeah, we're here on Tuesday, but not Thursday. That lab will be due when we come back. When we come back, you will have lab, but all we're doing is turning that in, I believe, and checking it out. Uh, because we're not doing the... Well, that was never on the outline. That week, it said the um, radical brumination. We're not doing that one because we did the deals alder a couple weeks ago instead. So we'll just check out. We'll turn in that uh, double E2 worksheet. Uh, any last questions? Oh, I rem remember, some of you have the opportunity of attending this seminar this Friday, the seminar. Which sections are to attend this? I can't remember. I can't remember, look back at the email, but some of you attended before. Some of you asked if you can attend, but there were certain sections that should attend this Friday. But just remember that. Uh, one o'clock in this room. Anything else, guys? Okay, have a good night.